So, uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome everyone to the call today. Um, it's a wonderful day in Melbourne, and uh, we've got quite an exciting topic today. We're going to be talking about how big business uses automated closed-loop marketing to steal leads from the little guy. Now, what's that all about? Well, probably not me the best person to explain it, but I'd like to introduce our co-presenter today, who's Luch from Symantia. Now, I know, I know, I've known Luch for a long time, and I've known of Symantia, who quite involved in the web marketing side of things. So I might get him to uh, introduce himself, say good day, good day, Luch. Hey, David, how are you? And hi to all of you out there as well. Uh, this is uh, this is a really exciting topic for us. Um, we've been involved in this kind of industry for quite some time, um, but mo mostly on the technology side. But uh, what I wanted to share with you today was uh, just an idea of the sorts of things that we're working with, and in particular, the sorts of things that our clients um, are getting from the, the work that we're doing. Um, you know, I went to bed last night and I was sitting there thinking about all of this and the webinar and presentation for today and uh, suddenly this thought popped into my mind and I thought, oh God, it was uh, something that happened about 10 years ago. Uh, if, if you ever um, had an opportunity lay on your lap, and that's not to say that this is about an opportunity for you, but to had something that lay, to lay on your lap and you couldn't go for it. Uh, we had an experience about oh, 13 years ago or so and we looked at purchasing a piece of land in Marengo, which is just southeast of Melbourne, where we live. And uh, the opportunity was just way too good. It was uh, about $70,000 for a thousand square meters of land just near the beach. It was just glorious. It was at a time when the GST just kicked in here in Australia and uh, we tried to interact with the banks and everything and everyone was in disarray. We happened to be out there on that particular weekend and everything was in disarray. And um, the banks just didn't come to the party. And it wasn't because we didn't have the finances in place. It wasn't for any other reason except that they didn't have their act together. Um, that's kind of, I don't know why that thought popped into my mind yeah. at the time. It was just insane. Um, but this is, a, this is a little bit different. This is um, about uh, what we call automated closed loop marketing. Right. So can you give us a bit of a rundown? What is closed loop marketing? Which... So closed loop marketing is about um, closing the loop. When, you, when you're doing in, um, internet marketing or online marketing of any kind, yep. uh, the whole process is about getting people to come to your websites and to have them do something on your website, ideally to become a lead as part of your sales process. Mm. And lots of people will go out and they will focus on all sorts of things. They will do their SEO and they will develop their website and they will um, fill it with content. And um, the, the ultimate goal is to generate a contact in their database. Yeah. Um, and that, that's for them, that's a one way process. What automated closed loop marketing does is it looks at tying in that whole process of getting people to your website and onto your database in a way that lets you make smart decisions about where you invest in the future. Yep. This is this is an ongoing process. Okay, so so really, I understand what you're saying because I, I meet a lot of people when we coach businesses, and, and the biggest challenge is that they're spending more money than they ever have on internet marketing right now. They they are, and it's kind of interesting. Um, there are there was a study done by Forbes um, in 2012, which yep. looked at how much people spend on, or how much businesses spend on marketing. And in turn, how much of that marketing budget they actually spend online. Mm. Now, there are some of the key areas there, if you look at, if you're in the business to business marketing space, what Forbes found out was that you'd spend about 5% of your marketing budget in the B2B space. Right. If you're in the business to consumer marketplace, you'd spend about 15%. Right. This, this is, is a revenue, budget. right? This is, a, this is of your marketing budget. So they, they, they turned around and said that the average marketing budget um, actually, I'll rephrase that. The average marketing budget that a business-to-business -business, um, company will spend on online yeah. is about 21% of their overall marketing budget. Right. And in the case of um, business to a business to consumer as well, it's the same amount. Now, the total revenue, the total budget, the total amount of revenue that they spend on marketing yes. is split between five and 15%. So if right. you if you look at the, um, for a, let's say a medium sized company or a small to medium sized company in the one million to two and a half million dollar revenue yep. range, mm. the average business to consumer type customer will end up spending between 31 and a half and 78 thousand dollars in online. Wow. 
and then whether that's whether that's doing activity online, whether that's getting their website developed, whether that's putting in place software to do list collection and list creation, whether that's even getting people on to create campaigns for them. All right, so that's a pretty serious investment in internet marketing, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is, and it's. Um, I think it's growing. I, I think we're hearing over and over again uh, this whole thing about online marketing and internet yeah. marketing is you have to be on it is what the industry is telling everyone. Yeah, well, I, th I think I think what it is is like there's cyclic change in markets and there's structural change. And really the internet's here to stay and more and more people are getting online and they've been talking about mobile, getting online and searching on mobile browsers now. Yeah. So if you're not online, you're missing out on such a large share of the market. But, uh, you know, people are confused because there's so many things you can do to be online, isn't there? Because it used to be just you need a website. <laughs> That's right. And then a few years ago it was the social media thing. Everyone needed to be social. So, so and then these days it seems that every second message that we're getting across our desk at least is this whole thing about you need to rank on page one of Google. Yeah. Uh, and you know, search engine optimization is all the buzzword. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, it kind of is. And it's it's a buzzword and it's important as well. Because just looking at um, if you the as this diagram shows, mm. if you look at the first five positions yep. on the first page of Google, if you're the first link you're likely to get up to about 53% of, of click-throughs right. to your website. Mm. And so lots of people will aim and they'll do they'll, they'll, they'll spend most of that marketing budget on trying to get to the first page of Google mm -hmm. and trying to get into that first position. Now, the thing is that this, this thing of SEO, search engine optimization, yeah. it isn't rocket science. Right. It isn't brain surgery. Yeah. Um, if, if you have a specific focus on and you know who your market is mm. and what they're talking about yep. it's actually really really easy to get on there and then I, david uh, there's a couple of other speakers who'll be coming down the track who will teach you how to get onto the first page of google yeah let's see i suppose it's only a piece of the puzzle really isn't it it is it, and it, it it's a piece of the puzzle it's an important piece of the puzzle yeah um i think the key thing is that this whole internet and online space is becoming just ultra competitive mm. um and there's a whole bunch of things, a, a whole array of things that where the world has changed now. Yep. And yet you have to think about taking what you used to do, whether in the physical world or in the offline world, yep. and translating it into the new world. Right. You know, where companies would uh, spend a lot of their budget and do a lot of activity trying to get onto that first page of Google. Mm -hmm. Today, what we talk about is... That it, it's all about the conversion rate optimization. It's all about yep. when people come to your site, what are you doing with them? Yeah, well, this is the big thing because I, I think people are getting the hits or getting the clicks. And the problem is they don't necessarily turn into dollars. In a lot of cases, I speak to people who say most of the people who come through are time wasters. You know, And, and I look at that and I say, well, really the issue here is not one of SEO. Um, it's one of what happens once someone does click through or arrive at your web page. So when you talk about conversions, that's and it. yeah, and, and arguably it could be said that if if most of the people coming to your website are time wasters, then what you're ranking for on the first page of Google is wrong. Yeah. You know, ideally what you want to be doing is you want to be um, understanding who your market is. There's a there's a great story of um, there's a, an old uh, an old man and a young boy and they're traveling from one town to another and they have a donkey beside them and uh, the old man's sitting on the donkey and the young boy's walking along and as they're walking along there's they suddenly encounter um, a group of people and mm -hmm. the, the group of people turn around to the old man and say how could you you're riding there on top of the donkey yeah and the young boy is walking along how could you do such a thing and so they have a think about it and the old man goes you know they're right and so what they do is they swap and they put the young boy on the donkey and the old man walks along and they walk along a little bit further and they encounter another group of people and uh, and they turn around and say, how could you do this? The, old, the young boy who's got so much energy is traveling on top of the donkey. And the poor and old, man the poor old man's the walking donkey. alongside. And so they have a think about it a bit more and they go, yeah, they're right. And so what they do is they both get on the donkey. And as they're traveling a little bit further, they encounter another group of people and the group of people turn around and say, how the poor donkey, both on the donkey. And, and so they have a think about this and they go, you know, they're right. And so they, um, 
both get off the donkey and they're walking alongside the donkey. They encounter another group of people and the group of people goes, look at the idiots. You know, they have a perfectly good donkey there and they're both walking along with the donkey. And so the, the old man and the little boy have a think about this and the old man goes, you know, they're right. Maybe what we need to do is maybe we need to carry the donkey. Mm -hmm. And so they pick up the donkey and they're walking along and they're just about to get to the town that they need to get to. And they come across a bridge and they need to cross the bridge and there's a huge river down, down uh, below the bridge and everything. And so they're carrying this donkey, the two of them, and they go to walk across the bridge and the donkey slips and falls off down into the river. Now, the moral of the, the moral of the story there is that if you attempt to please everyone along the way, you might as well kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> and this is this is the thing about what happens in internet marketing as well. Yeah. Everyone has the goal of trying to get onto the first page of Google. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're looking at all of the words that might fit their business. And what they're forgetting to do is they're forgetting about what's important to their customers. Okay. So let's go through some of those differences. So old world versus new world. So, so yeah, in the old world, everyone, and then even today, one. it's all about getting onto page one of Google. It's all about search engine optimization. Today, it's about what you do with those people once they visit your site. Yeah. And then so we call this conversion rate optimization. Sure. Um, in the old world, it was all about what technology do you use? Mm. And then I can come back with a whole bunch of acronyms associated with that. But today, it's all about cloud services the people and the resources that you apply and how to make them all work together with each other. Yeah. In the old world, it was about getting your website yep. up and running. Today, it's about thinking about uh, the 24 by 7 sales presence. Right. Your website needs to be selling. Yes. Um, in the old world, it was about getting traffic to your website. Yep. In the new world, it's understanding that the traffic are visitors and you want to make sure that those visitors are qualified Mm -hmm. And they're filtered, so you're yeah. only getting the people that are relevant to your to your industry, to your business. Excellent. In the old world, it was about, and this is in the physical world, you would meet with somebody yeah. and you would sit down with them and you would ask them for the order. This is Sales 101. In the new world, we call this call to action. It's about crafting the message that helps people understand or helps people be able to buy from you Excellent. online. Yeah. And I think the key difference today is that, to succeed in this online world, mm. you really need an understanding of sales and marketing and a follow-up process for mm. your leads. Isn't it interesting? Because really what you're talking about now is the whole world's coming back to, you know, really the online world is just an additional tool. It's technology that allows us to do our job better. <clears throat> because when you talk about interaction, when you talk about, you know, closing the sale, when you talk about all of these, uh, you know, these new world activities, it's really going back to the fundamentals of having a sales process having a pipeline, having salespeople and communication or conversations with the prospective clients. Yeah, you're right. And then and I think it's all, it's more of an evolution than going back mm. because what we're seeing is the, the way that technology is used now, the way that yep. the internet is used, it's, it's much more advanced than what it was five years ago. Sure. Um, there are new tools, new techniques, new software, new ways of thinking about all of this. It's much more aligned to sales and marketing. Fantastic. So when we talk about um, implementing or when we talk about uh, automated closed loop marketing, yep. where we're talking about how to align um, the website or, or what you're doing in the online world or what you're doing in the internet to your internal sales processes. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of this we've put into play with some of our larger customers. You know, as, as Samantha, we deal with um, customers that range from the small to medium sized business through to large ASX listed companies. And what we learn from them is that, that what we learn from the large customers is that they have systems in place already, not for dealing with online, but for dealing with their own internal business processes, their own sales processes. Right. And we've learned to be able to map those to the online world. And mm -hmm. we've learned some tools and techniques for being able to map those to the online world. And, and here's a couple, um, it's almost a four-step process of moving your sales processes or your sales mm. from offline to online. Right. Um, the, the first key important one that we've come across is that you absolutely need to have um, a sales and marketing process in your business already. Right. And let's not even think about the online side of it. 
sales. Just needs to be a sales it process. Just needs to be a sales process mm. in your business mm -hmm. with targets. Mm. Um, and I think the targets are important. So if you're not, if you don't achieve your targets, then you can look at revising your sales process. Yes. If you do achieve your targets, then maybe you can look at adjusting your sales processes to grow even more. Mm. The, the other key thing, and this kind of relates to the donkey story as well, is you need to know your ideal customer. You, you absolutely need to define your ideal customer. Yep. You know, one of the clients that we have um, who are in the transport, and, I'll, and I'll, I've got some slides to share some of the work that we've done with them. Great. Some of the metrics that we've got. One of the clients are in the transport company. And what we found when we spoke to them initially was we asked them the question, um, who are you selling to? Mm. And yeah, their initial indication was everyone and anyone, anyone who wants their car moved. <laughs> and it's like, well, let's think about this because there are so many people. We did some research and there was something like about 200,000 car movements per year. Yeah. Um, which one's most important to you? If, mm. if there were one particular type of customer, yeah. where if you could get more and more orders just like that, mm. would, that would make your business just absolutely um, a, a wonderful to deal with, yep. who would they be? And so they gave us that information. That's interesting, isn't it? Because defining your target market is, is marketing 101 <clears throat> from, you know, 100 years ago. It is. But I think what technology is forcing people to do is actually have to have documented processes, to documented defined markets because the world has just opened up. Well, it has. The, when you do know your ideal customer, when you have defined your ideal customer, yeah. the words that you use, the images that you mm. use, the colors that you use, and then this is, this is a really interesting area, um, the, when they're mapped to your ideal customer, your conversion rate just goes through the roof. Yeah. Your ability to um, influence, to persuade, to communicate with them, to, to um, impart knowledge to them and educate them just goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the next key area that we work on, being yeah. able to craft a specific offer mm -hmm. to those people. Yep. Mapping it all to a timeline and then testing and optimizing. You know, and that's those last two bits, yeah. those last two areas are really the areas within the, the automated closed loop marketing system. Um, that that are, are the key things to automating the whole process. Well, this is the part that gets me excited because you know, in my in my 13 years of coaching businesses, one of the hardest things to get a business owner to do is to test and measure. <clears throat> and with internet marketing, all of a sudden, it's a part of the process. It is, and it's it's evolved again. When when we were just building websites, or, yep. or when companies were just getting websites mm. installed, they never thought about this. It was about getting a brochure up there in the electronic world. Yeah, and the the Everyone from technology through to business through to an understanding of what is possible has yeah. evolved. Yeah. And increasingly what uh, mature organizations are doing now is they're letting the numbers drive the investment. Mm -hmm. So when they're testing and they're measuring, then they're able to make informed decisions yeah. about where they invest in Excellent. the future. That's fantastic. Um, and here's, here's an example. I, I mentioned we have a, a large client, pre-car transport. Yeah are a company involved in the um, relocation of cars. So they move cars. They, they did a lot of work with um, Holden and Ford, who are now going. But uh, increasingly what they're doing is there's um, a lot of the transport at the commercial level, a lot of the transport of cars coming in from overseas through the wharf and distributed out to car dealers. Mm. What they also offer through this particular business unit that we're working with is transport for you and me, David. You know yeah. That. So we want to move a car, they'll organize it for us. They'll organize it for us. Um, so in the very first instance when we sat down with them was we, we sought to understand who it was, mm. who their customer was. And as I mentioned, they indicated, oh, it's anyone who needs to move a car. Yeah. And it's like we need to narrow it down and we need to focus on a particular customer. Okay. Now, when we first implemented them is a little over a year ago. Mm. Um we asked them for their goal. What's the specific measure that they need to have in place? And they said, oh, we need to get more quotes coming into the business. And we went, okay. So we focused on the whole thing. We went live yep. on the 13th of April. It was Good Friday. Okay. So within two weeks, it was the day after Anzac Day. Within yep. two weeks, we got a call from help from them saying the call center manager was getting way too many calls. She had to handle 70 calls herself 
It was the day after Anzac Day. Can you do anything to help? So then we looked at building an automated quoting system for them. Mm -hmm. So in the very first instance, it was about getting their phone number, getting people to call the call center so that they would take out quotes. Yeah. Right. So that was the specific result yep. That, yep. that they needed. Yep. So then we sat down and we built the um, the software to do it. And it's kind of whiz bang because it has Google Maps on there and we can integrate it so that people can see. There's a, the technology goes in there. People can see where they're moving from, where they're moving to. Yep. Um, we have some smarts in there to be able to do the pricing based on the two different points. But the key thing with what the new world of online marketing and the new world of the internet allows us to do is it allows us to track people, or if not people, it allows us to track successes mm. through each stage of this quoting process. Yep. Now, the quoting process is a four-stage step. In the first step, you enter your where you where you're leaving sure. second step where you're going to third step um, is entering your card details and the fourth step is entering your email and lastly you end up with a quote at the end so sure. so we we mapped this out you know using analytics tools through each stage of this software and we're able to measure and if you look at the graph uh, the little chart which is kind of a funnel representation on the mm. right hand side. Yeah. You can see that the number of people who are coming in to the website, into the quoting section of the website, yep. in over a particular period, I can't recall what this period was, I think it's about 15 days or something, mm -hmm. um, is 1,700 people. Yep. Now, as part of that, from going from entering their pickup details yep. to going to the delivery details, 1,200 people, 1,263 people go through. So there's, we suddenly know that there's a 74% conversion. conversion going from the first step to the second step. Right. So one of the areas that we may focus on is why, how can we increase that conversion rate? Okay. So, so really what you're saying is that you've got multiple conversion rates that you can now measure accurately. Yeah. Which means that you can now start to identify which part of the conversion process, because it's now no longer just one conversion rate. It's a whole series of conversion rates. You can accurately identify where to where to focus and where to improve. That's right. That's right. Now here's an interesting one. Uh, we asked the question: Does color really make a difference? Yeah. Um, and we have a particular call to action, and you can see there's two different versions there. One labeled one. So exactly the same ad. Exactly the same ad. The only difference is the color of the button. Yeah, that's right. And that's I, right. I I wonder if people on uh, the call could just type in. One or two, which one do you think? Got so in, into the chat window or the question window, if people can just type in the number one or two. We'll just get okay, we've got a two coming through. Yeah, a couple more. We've got a one coming through. Yep. We've okay. got another one coming through. Another one. I, I think one. most people are guessing, aren't they? Like, unless you know, what is the difference between orange and green? And, and, and I wonder what the rationale was it for. Maybe, maybe green meant go. Because we see that in our traffic lights all the time. Okay. What I'm seeing is about two to one. On the number one is the most popular most popular suggestion. Um, about twice as many people have chosen number one over number two. So what are the what's the reality? So the reality is going from orange to green gave us a twenty one point three percent increase in the number of people clicking through to the quoting system. Just the colour of the button. Just the colour of the button. Wow. So you wouldn't be able to measure that in a real world. And you wouldn't be able to guess that either. It would be just a guess, yes. and you'd be 50-50 right if you did. Yeah. So, so really what you're saying is now we can actually measure with, to a decimal point of accuracy, what any change in any part of our conversion process yeah. is, is, a, is affecting, how it's affecting the business. Yeah. Awesome. Here's another one for you. At the last step where people are asked to enter their email address, um, and, you know, and entering email address can be a, a particularly personal thing um we had two versions of the question why do i need to provide my contact details yeah i'm just wondering again one or two which one resulted in the highest number of people clicking through to the final step okay, so the let's get that vote up so number one is the uh more lengthy uh response to uh why now, do i need if you notice the, the the major difference between one and two yeah is that in one we provided an indication of what they could expect in the next step. Right. Whereas in version two, there is no indication of what to expect in the next step. Okay, so at the moment, we've got a majority on number two. 
Uh, we'll just get a few more votes in. Okay, we're about even. <laughs> we're about even again. So again, it's a it's a 50-50. It's only by testing, it's only by implementing it and running it that we get going from an increase in 9.8% in the number of people actually receiving a quote. So 9.8% more with the option two. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's right. So the shorter one. Yeah. Okay. And then what we're rapidly learning, and I think what uh, successful internet marketing companies doing, or what successful companies are doing yep. with their internet marketing, yep. is they recognize that there isn't a best option. Yep. There's only a better option. And it's a constantly evolving process, understanding your audience, understanding what they're doing, understanding how to improve things for them yep. uh, are the key things. And it's only by clearly knowing what your goals are yep. and finding what to measure that you're able to do that. And, and this is constantly changing as well. Okay. okay. Um, we love the term, always be collecting data, the A, B, C, D of internet marketing. You know, I think, I think in the old world, you know, we, we collect lots and lots of data but not really know how to use it. Yep. In this new world, we're acting on acting on the data mm -hmm. with virtual immediacy. Fantastic. And we also know that what successful businesses do mm -hmm. and what the large businesses do is they always follow up. And I think this is... Um, not just restricted to or not just limited to the online world. This is this is kind of sales 101. Yep. You get an inquiry from someone, hey, what's yep. the best thing that you do? You follow up with them. You give them a call. What we can do in the online marketing space now is that, hey, we can engage with them through other means. We can send them an email. Yep. We can uh, provide them with information. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, David, I've heard you talk about this before, um, that if we look at the the, the ex uh, the x-axis. Yep. So we've got the first contact, the second contact, and the third yeah. contact, and, and the fourth, fourth and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, what we find is that 100% of salespeople, 100% of salespeople will follow up on the first contact. They, they get a call from someone or an inquiry, and they'll ring them up. And hey, you know, about 2% of people will actually buy something based on the first contact. Mm. Uh, that, that number That's changes. Low, isn't it? it's, it's pretty low. And what happens is, there are so many people that just fall off and go, I'll never contact them again. I don't know what it was. I won't contact. Yeah. As we move along to the fourth contact and below, it's those persistent people. There are 13% of, of salespeople will follow up, beyond, will follow four up beyond four times. And guess what? There's 90% of conversions go out that happen there. Because it is interesting as a salesperson, and we, we train a lot of salespeople here or people to be, to be better at sales. And the thing we're contending with the most is fear. Of rejection and people will not follow up because someone has said no or they feel like they're interrupting and the or they're not matter, ready yet right. or and so here, here's the salesperson they'll start making up stories as to well they don't really want to talk to me therefore they don't want a follow-up call they'll call me when they're ready and, and really it's a mind game so using a computerized follow-up system basically means that we can actually not only measure but we don't have emotional involvement yeah. with the follow-up so yeah yeah occurs. yeah there's another interesting um, what we, what's been referred to as the rule of 45. Um, yep. and, and this has been tested. It, it kind of came up as a theory, yep. um, someone's theory uh, several years ago, and it's mm. been tested over and over again. And uh, what they're finding very rapidly is that um, if you take a, a group of people um, who inquire about a product or a service, yep. then if they're followed up, 45% mm. of them, will buy that product or service from someone within 12 months. Right. So 100 inquiries, let's say 100 inquiries come in, 45, 45 of those will buy within the first 12 months. Okay. So even though we might be getting a very low conversion rate at the initial contact, um, the reality is that if someone's made contact, they're in the market to some level. Yeah. Um, so what you're suggesting is 45% of those people will make a decision within the next 12 months. It, Correct. Right. And now they will buy within the next 12 months. Now, you want to be in there if you're following up with them, Yeah. then that will be the case. And then there's this kind of formula that goes through that says the number of inquiries multiplied by the rule of 45 will lead to a purchase within the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're following up, whatever your follow-up ratio is or follow-up percentages, yeah. that will give you the number of prospects yeah. 
then you start introducing your conversion rate, which will give you the number of customers and your average dollar value, which will give you your revenue. Mm. This, the same thing applies if we take that formula and we look at two different companies. Yep. Now, I've intentionally structured it like this. So we've got company A, which is, um, let, let's say it's a smaller business. Um, they have a very, very specialized product. Um, average price of the product is $10,000. Um, both is company B yep. is a larger business. And what they can do is they can make the product much cheaper. Okay. Yeah. So they're making the <clears throat> same product yep. in the same industry for $5,000, half the price. Okay. What company B does as well is they look at doing incremental improvements to the conversion rate. Right. So they may have both started with a conversion rate of, say, 20%. What company B has done is they've looked at making incremental improvements, and they've, in, they've improved their conversion rate by 10%. Okay. So they're now doing 22% conversion rate. Yep. Both companies get the same number of inquiries. Yep. And based on the rule of 45, they follow up. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's 450 people who will purchase in the next 12 months. Right. So company A, so this is the smaller business who maybe does things manually, maybe yep. has a group of salespeople okay, on the road. So they're not consistent in their... Not consistent in their follow-up follow -up. approach. Yep. Um, and so now they might follow up 20% of the time. They may just look at a number and say, hey, um, I, I, you know what, I don't think this business is going to buy, so I won't. I won't follow yeah, up. Or they them. fall between the cracks, which is what yeah. happens in most cases. Yeah. Um, company B, on the other hand, says we will follow up with every single person. Yep. Regardless. Right. So what happens already, there's a massive change because uh, company A's got 90 prospects at this point in time and company B's got 450. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the, the, big, the big thing that you've mentioned here is the whole notion of having closed-loop marketing means there's no cracks. No cracks for people to fall through. Every lead, regardless of the relationship that we have with that person and how we feel about them will go through the same process. That's right. And, and you know, if there is a crack, if, if there's something that you can't answer for, the, the thing is to get in there and find out how. Yeah. Um, ultimately, then we look at the conversion rate yeah. uh, that happens. Yeah. You know, company A converts 20%, company B at 22%. And we can see that by the time we get down to the end, even with mm. a product that is half the price, yeah. there's a... 275% increase, in, increase revenue, in revenue, which is massive. And, and why is that? By implementing some, some form of continuous improvement over the conversion rate and by following up with every single prospect yeah. that is out there. It's interesting, isn't it? So, so really, this, this whole notion of capturing every lead and making sure we manage them is becoming more important now than ever. Yeah. So these people that are saying they're getting too many leads, the reality is not that they're getting too many leads, they just don't have a process to process those leads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And there are there are um, very very simple ways of being able to do this. Um, Excellent. And this is kind of a um, a way that's familiar to I'd say a large number of people, and yep. it's, it's the traditional follow up marketing one hundred and one. Yep. So let's go through this. And this is um, many of you are familiar with um, email marketing. Get people into a contact database of some sort, mm -hmm. and then send them a sequence of, of emails. Um, and you know it might be something like a Weber or um, vertical response, Mail constant Chimp. contact, MailChimp, which is even a, a free product at this price point. Um, so you you may be out there, you may have a form on your website, you may have you may have gone to a networking event of some sort, yep. or social media, wherever the case may be. Your ultimate goal is to get people into some form of contact database. Right. Once they're into a contact database, then you can start scheduling emails to them mm -hmm. with periodic delays and the like. Um, the email may have links in them to click through to your website to get more information, to yeah. download products. And you can track all of those. Now, what the, the, the important thing about this is it begins putting in place mm. a follow-up method yeah. or a follow-up sequence yeah. that allows you to follow up with those people 100% of the time. Anybody right. who lands in your customer database yeah. will receive those messages. Okay. Um, and you'll turn around and say, hey, but there's nothing new about all of this. The, the key thing here is that every communication that you have with somebody, mm. you're able to also glean important information about them. And this right. is really the advanced nature of follow-up marketing. This is kind of where the, the technology today mm -hmm. has allowed the business processes of today to really come into play. Think about you're a, you're a salesperson and... Um, you're out there and 
you've just networked with somebody, you've got their details. Yeah. Now, there's a certain amount of knowledge and information that you'd have about that person it's already. Great. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and just sending them a blanket, templated email, yeah. you're probably doing yourself a disservice. Right. Yeah. So this is this is traditional sales 101. When you meet someone for the first time, remember something specific about them and a personal thank you note or some sort of follow-up that relates to the specific discussion will build that trust and that bond. That's right. That's right. So when, as we move that process through to the online world, through yeah. to the internet world, um, there are in, there's information that you can glean from people mm. based on the emails that they read, yes. the links that they click on, right. um, other special attributes and tags. And this is now everything that sits below that mm -hmm. that, that initial simple email forwarder. There's there's information that you can get based on what people are doing with the information they receive right. from you. Right, right, right. So, so what you're saying now is that people's interaction with your email can be actually stored and acted upon. And yeah, in virtually in real time. Right. So they click on a link, you have the ability to put them into what's known as another campaign. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact that they clicked on a link um, about um, one of your uh, referral marketing strategies, David, yep. means that you know that they're interested in referral marketing strategies. You yep. may also know that they're interested in growing your business, in growing their business. Right. You may also, they may also know that uh, they're interested in more sales. Right. So they, so what you're doing now is you're literally automating the salesperson. Yeah. <laughs> so so the salesperson who has a conversation with you over over a coffee, and you mention that you've got some sales needs and you might have a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They're, they're they're writing these notes and they're looking at them as opportunities and they're going back and strategizing those. And this is traditionally how we used to sell. And so we create a strategy based on conversations. Yeah, that's right. And so now what you're saying is we can actually systemize this whole process and get more and more intelligent about how. We automate the whole process. Yeah, you know, we used to think in the past about just going from A to B, as in that top line there, mm -hmm. just sending a whole bunch of emails, and when the emails run out, yeah, nah, you know, then, then all of a sudden the sales process comes to an end. Yes, the more specific we can get about marketing and communicating with the person at the other end, yeah, and we do that by gathering gathering information about them by mm. by having them assist us in the process, really. Right. So, so, so the, the thing, I, the, the example I like to use for this is Google. You know, if you use Gmail, Gmail allows you to let Google read your emails and determine what marketing they're going to put forward to you based on the content of your emails. You go to Amazon and you buy books and they start profiling you. And uh, so they can start to understand what you read and what your preferences are. And then they can start recommending books based on who you are as opposed yeah. to just, you know, promoting what books on sale. So this intelligence is now being made accessible to the small business owner just through through these sorts of systems. That's right. And there's a there's a, a, a number of systems out there, and I, I didn't want to get into talking about a specific system. But, David, I know that you're using one at the moment that's actually really, really clever. Yep. Uh, we did align ourselves with it as well. Um, Infusionsoft. David, what have you learned from using something like Infusionsoft? Yeah. Well, the, the exciting part for me really is um, now now I can do a lot of what I what I used to have to teach salespeople to do. We can do through intelligent email marketing. And I'm not sure what the term for this is because I know that ma email that just goes out on a blanket basis is, is you know is getting closer and closer to being seen as spam. Yeah. Um, so now people are actually being a, a bit more discerning and they're saying, well, I don't mind receiving emails, but at least can they be relevant to my needs? There's almost an expectation that's occurring. So, so what we're doing now is we're spending a lot of time just investing in understanding what people's buying motives are and creating sales emails that actually reflect what their needs are. Yeah. And like, like you say, the, the telemetry, I call it telemetry because now I can actually look at a person's email reading pattern and actually determine what their needs are. And we can actually create other sequences that we can move them into. So in simple terms, it's just like, it's like having a high level salesperson recording what they do and putting it through, a, creating a process out of that so that we can mimic that for other people as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, and I think coming back to the, the slides that I put up yep. uh, much earlier on, you know, there's the, the last two points there, the testing, measuring and optimizing. Yep. Um, it's something that you do anyway. It's something that, mm. uh, that you can do more and more of and something that that you should do more and more yep. of, especially if you're getting a website. It's it's no longer about getting a, a web page up there or a brochure up there. Yeah. 
um, the, the notion of follow-up communications mapped to a timeline yeah. um, is increasingly important as well. And I've, I've covered a lot of that off. And also to a buying signal. And I think this is probably the biggest frustration I, I see with most salespeople is they miss an opportunity. Yeah. They didn't read the play or they dropped the ball or they lost the card or they just physically forgot because we are humans. And I, I think these days, it used to be okay because everyone was on the same playing field. But what's starting to happen these days is the people that are using these automated tools can actually eliminate those errors or reduce those errors almost totally. And what it means is that if I'm using the traditional sales method, which used to be the you know the five by four cards, where I'd write the notes down from someone I met and I have to remind myself to call them. And if I don't get in touch with them because they're not around, the automated system doesn't skip a beat. So I, th I think really what's happening is that the sales world is now being trans, almost transferred into the online world. So it's not that it's just automated, it's actually taking live sales yeah. processes and now putting them into a system so that we can sort of make sure that we don't have those dropouts. Anymore. And and as technologists, we can do that more and more. I think, yeah. you know, the, where it used to be really, really challenging mm -hmm. uh, and only the big players could actually play and invest hundreds of millions of dollars in yeah. In systems, yeah, you know, this is now being made available to much smaller organisations. Yeah, and the the cost of entry into the whole thing is, is much easier. It is a really good point because you know the the irony of the whole thing is that the principles are exactly the same. You know, we, we, we teach a lot of people all the things you've talked about today: average dollar sale, conversion rate, number of transactions. We've been teaching those principles for years, and they're the basis, they're the foundation right. for for all of this. But it used to be manual. Yeah. Right. So, you know, sending a newsletter out used to be physical. These days people go, oh, a newsletter, you know, it's hard to create it. Well, sometimes it's not about just being generic newsletters anymore. It's about having information that people are interested in, that they're going to read, that builds a relationship with yeah. you. You know, conversion rate. Now, we've just demonstrated today you can have five or six separate conversion rates between someone seeing you in the search engine to clicking through to actually act, acting on your website. Now, if we don't know who they are, we can't control that mm. conversion. So measuring these things now means we can optimize and we can test things instantly. So 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 the, the whole the whole technology, what what it's doing now is allowing people to extend themselves. I look at technology as an extension of self. Yeah. And so if people have got a crappy sales process and they use technology, they're in trouble. But if people have got a good sales process and they can now map that across to the internet. And that's something that you do, build a great sales process. Absolutely. So you're a genius at this. <laughs> I don't know about genius, I just know that it's a must have, right? Yeah. And, and and so many people I meet in business just don't have a sales process. And you know, usually when we coach people, it's one of the very first things we'll look at. And you know, we, we talk about it often that people will overspend on lead generation and underspend on sales process yeah. or conversion. Yeah. And they don't do it's just one of those fundamentals where we run a seminar and it's called five ways to maximize the profits of your internet marketing. We've got one coming up in a few weeks. And the thing I start the whole conversation about is that I show people, I demonstrate to people they're spending too much on internet marketing or lead generation mm. and not enough on the rest of the process. And most people are convinced. And I say, most people in this room have got too many leads. And by the end of this session, I'm going to demonstrate that you have too many leads and you actually should be investing in other areas. And the light bulbs go off. Yeah, and really, it's no different to what we've just been discussing today. It is. It is uh, though the problem that we experienced with Precar when we went live mm. um, was within two weeks they had so many calls coming in. Yeah, but they didn't know how to handle it, and we we got rid of the tire kickers by mm. by putting the pricing up on the website. Yeah, we got rid of the tire kickers. Um, but they still suddenly got a huge influx of people and they didn't know how to handle it. Mm. And it also brings up that point of people buying on price. Because what I believe these days is people buy on, um, I suppose, immediate value. Mm. Because too many times we'll go online and we'll do searches and we'll actually, I don't know if you've done this, but you'll put in a, a request for information with, on a website and the response either doesn't come at all or it's three or four days later. Yeah. And, and really people's expectation is if I submit an inquiry on a website, I expect response. These days, immediately. Immediately. Right? Immediately, I expect at least an email, system systemized email that says, thanks for your inquiry. We will have someone contact you within 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever it might be. Yeah. But to get nothing, uh, it's sort of like pe people are very quick to switch. I'm like, oh, hang on, no response. I don't even know if it works. Is there someone else? Is there someone actually in that company or is it just a website? 
So the whole idea of having sales incorporated in the web strategy is now is now not optional, it's critical. It is, and it, it's it's the number one, meets the whole foundation. Um, it's the whole foundation about building all of this stuff. Yeah. When you have a sales process, even in, in your business, mm. it's taking that sales process into the online world, not trying to get to the online world to fit some kind of sales process. It's Fantastic. taking your sales process Excellent. to fit all of that. Okay, look, Luch, what I was going to do is open up the floor to any questions. So if anyone on the line has any questions, please feel free to throw them into the questions section. I know we're coming towards the end. I just wanted to save a little bit of time. So so we're just going to open up the floor to some questions. While, while we're doing that, I suppose, could, could you just give me maybe a number one or number two, you know, thing that people need to consider when they are de developing their web marketing strategy? Um, I'd say the number one thing, and this is in the order of, of um, that chart that's on the screen right now. Yeah. The, the number one thing is absolutely have your sales process in place. Yeah. If you don't have a sales process in place, don't even attempt to get online because chances are what's going to happen is you'll be spending a great deal of money getting online yeah. with very, very limited results. The yeah. second most important thing is to know who your ideal customer is. Yep. Because unless you know your ideal customer, again, you'll be going the scattergun approach yeah. and you're shooting for everyone and your return on investment for that whole thing yeah. is going to be next to useless. Absolutely. So um, look, I suppose we have got one of the questions here is really, um, so what do people do? How, how, where do they start? So the, the whole thing, the whole way to start, and we, we created this for anybody who's listening in on this webinar at the moment. We've created this service. It's a service that we deliver our high-end clients. Yep. Um, what we do is we look at understanding, we sit down with them, we work through their sales process, and we completely map it to an online world. Yep. Um, now, the, the tool that we use, the service that we use, is a service called Infusionsoft. Yeah. <clears throat> David, I believe you use Infusionsoft as well. It's a, it's a customer relationship management system, but also allows you to do the follow-up marketing, which is the, the, the process that we've just run through as part of our automated closed-loop marketing. Yeah. Um, what we do is we sit down with you to completely map out your sales process mm -hmm. into a campaign. Now, you may not be an Infusionsoft user, or you may not have Infusionsoft at the moment, but having that mapped out in a way that lets you get the most amount of value when you do move it online. Yeah. And I, and I must take a step back and say, look, the software is just a tool. Okay. The, the reality of what we've been talking about today is that you must have a sales process. Now, there's many different tools that can be used. And it really depends on where people are at as to what is the right tool. Because for some people, pen and paper is still applicable. Yeah. Okay. So, so really, it's not about getting technology if you don't have any. It's about making sure that you've got some sort of process. Now, the second question that's come up is, you know, is it something people can do on their own? I'm sure. Um, it, it's certainly something you can learn to do on your own. Mm -hmm. um, we have been in the business now this year, actually, uh, 20 years. We've been involved in the technology side of things. Yeah. We think technology when we look at implementing all of this and we map it to a sales process. Yeah. Now, it's a huge learning curve that people go through yep. to get to all of this. And then the question becomes, mm. how much are you willing to invest in developing and designing and defining all of this yourself yep. versus getting in the expert help? Yep. You could get um, a, a digital marketer on staff who could probably begin working through this process mm. for what, $60,000 a year in salary? Yeah. Um, and again, to what extent will they help you go through all of this? So mm -hmm. it is something that you can do yourself. Yeah. There are free tools available. Yeah. Uh, the more value that you want to extract, the bigger the learning curve it is mm -hmm. for going through the whole so I think it touches on an on a, on a important point for most people, and it's that whole notion of having a CRM for a customer relationship management tool. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been in sales for over 20 years, and I remember we used to use a thing called Tracker, which was DOS-based. Yeah. Yeah. And people used to laugh at how archaic it was, but it just meant you wouldn't lose leads. Now, there wasn't email marketing in those days. It was really just software that we could use to track things. Um, and, and I think it's developed, you know, there's, there's products like ACT, there's products like um, Goldmine, and, and you just go through the whole myriad, and, and there's quite a few. And, and I often come back to the number one thing that you've already mentioned is it's not about the product, it's about the process. And it's about the organization having a process that matches their requirements. So they're not investing in technology where it's not appropriate. 
but also they are using technology where it can save them some money. Yeah. Because if you look, if you look at the return on investment, and really that's what it's all about, it's ROI. And so when, when you show us some of these numbers here, these companies that you're doing this work for, their return is massive. And, uh, you know, if, if someone said to me, I'll give you $2 for every dollar that, that you give me, how much would I give them? <laughs> you know, it, become, it becomes unlimited. And, and it's sort of tongue in cheek, but the truth of the matter is that all marketing should be measured. And if you can measure return on investment, all of a sudden it's not expense anymore, it's investment. We talk about this all the time as coaches. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is another question here, and it, it's sort of quite technical, it's specific, it's, it talks about the web design. How important is the design of the site, i.e. the navigation and the appearance? They, they can be really important. Um, yeah. And then I throw in a caveat as well. Yeah. Um, they can be really important if they've been designed with your ideal customer in mind. Mm. Um, and I think there's uh, there's two sides to this. One is that often the business owner or the website owner will design the site for them. Yep. Now, often they're not their, their ideal customer, they're the supplier. And if they design the site so that it looks good for them mm -hmm. or that it's uh, it, they find it easy to navigate, yep. but it misses the ideal customer side of things, yep. then uh, it, it will result in a failed website. And, and this goes across the board, yeah. uh, whether it's the navigation, whether it's the what we call the information architecture, whether it's the content that's on there. Yeah. Again, if they haven't designed for the ideal customer, yeah. then it will fail or, or it will have a low success rate. Mm. The second important part of this is that when you roll out the first version of your website, it is the first version of your website. Mm. And there's no predefined time frame to say, you know, this is a website that will be, that will um, be successful for, or, or will have, will yep. be in place for 12 months or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's the ongoing tuning and yeah. optimization. And so unless you build in the ability to capture numbers, yes. the ability to capture data, you just won't know. Well, this comes down to, you know, the, the fundamentals that I believe is you start with a website. It doesn't matter if it's good, bad or indifferent, it's a start. Mm -hmm. Then you measure. And when you measure, you can improve because what gets measured gets focused on, yeah. what gets focused on gets improved. So when people ask me what's the best marketing strategy, the answer is always, well, anything that you test. And if you change it and it improves, you keep the change. If it doesn't improve, you take the change away and you try something else. And unless you're moving. So, so one of the biggest fallacies is to create a website and it becomes static. You know, and people say, I, I need to get my website developed and they'll spend five, ten, twenty thousand $20,000 on creating this beautiful website. It's untested. I don't mean tested as in technically, I mean tested as in the market, we haven't mm. measured the response or the engagement. Now that, that colored thing, right? Now it's obvious in hindsight that green means go and yellow means caution. But in reality, most people don't think about that when they're getting their website designed. And, and we're not satisfied that it aligns to green as go and orange as something else. Well, all we know is we will keep testing. Yeah, but this is the thing, it's just a numbers game. Yeah. You know, and one of the fundamental philosophies that I, 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 you know, part of our coaching program, marketing is mathematics. And now that we have the tools to measure everything down to decimal places and accuracy, mm. we, we, we can really change things. So the answer is um, with a website, I think it has to be a living, breathing organism that is changed all the time. There is no time to stop changing it. It's only when you feel that you're getting maximum conversion. And so, so I, I think the answer to the question is it should be changed regularly. Because I, I know one thing I look for, and it's not so much these days anymore, but people used to put the year that the website was created. Yeah. on the front page and if you see something that says 2001 straight away your first impression of that company is gee they're not very dynamic so so I, I think the answer is to be dynamic right and to be able to change things and to be able to adapt to what the marketplace is telling us which we now can do yeah it's it's kind of a right back at the one of the very first slides that i put up about yep. where people are spending where businesses are spending a lot of their marketing dollars at mm -hmm. the moment is in getting ranked on the first page of google yeah um, one of the prerequisites, one of the easiest ways to get ranked on the first page of Google yeah. is to have useful content constantly going up. Yeah, interesting. So Google are getting it, and now they're telling everyone that you need to get it too. Yeah. So no more cheating of the system now, it's just purely about content. Yeah. Because I suppose one realization I had a while, a while back is that Google's customer is the person who advertises, but their product is the person who searches. So the person who searches needs to be there in order for them to get the advertising dollar. So they need to have valuable content or people will start turning away. So they're now changing their algorithms, they're doing all that, and they're, they're really just telling people what 
you know, Business Philosophy 101 from 100 years ago would tell you is to educate your client and teach them the value and the benefit of your product. Mm. And people will then come to you because of the benefits rather than the cost. Yeah. Absolutely. So, look, we are, I'm conscious of time. We're getting towards the end of the call. Is there any sort of summing up statements or, or things that you just wanted to say as, as leaving thoughts for the listeners? Look, summing up, if, if you have a website um, and it's not working for you or if you have a website and you have no idea how it's working for you or if you don't have a website and you need to get one up and running, um, more importantly, if you, if you understand that... Being online is about being aligned to the sales strategies. Then, and you're one of David's clients. You absolutely need to be talking to David about aligning your sales processes or getting in place a sales process mm. to work with that. Yeah. If you're ready to make that next transition into mapping your sales processes into something that's technical, mm. um, take us up on the offer that we have here. Yeah. Uh, call us. You have contact details, whether it's through David or, or through uh, myself. Um, and uh, we be we would love to be helping with all of this. It's an exciting time. It's an exciting industry, uh, and uh, we'd love to be getting exciting results for you as well. Fantastic. Well, Luch, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I know there's a few more questions coming through. What we'll do is we'll endeavour to forward them to you, and you can answer them by email. Would love to. Um, we are recording this webinar for so for those who have just sort of got part of the webinar. What we will be doing is sending that out the next day or two, um, and also contact details for both Luch and myself. Um, other than that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today, Luch. It's been very informative. David, thank you. And I uh, look forward to um, hearing some of the better results that you're getting as things develop. Great. Awesome. Thanks for your time, Luch. Thanks, guys.